Revelation tonight, and we're also in chapter 1 of James. But we'll be in Revelation first, which is rather fitting, seeing as it comes last. Revelation chapter 21. Where's Andrew? He would have laughed at that. Let me text Andrew telling Pastor cracked a joke and you weren't here to laugh. Oh well. It's hard not having a sympathetic audience. By the way, pray for the dollar store in Miami Beach. These are the biggest bags of Hershey Kisses they have right now. <laughs> that was the cheapest place to buy Hershey's Kisses. It's terrible, isn't it? How are kids going to make it on that? <laughs> That's York Mints, too. Don't forget about me, kids. I'm your friend. Put some down there for Caleb. <laughs> We're in Revelation 21. <laughs> Aluminum foil in the diapers. <laughs> Works. I've had many mothers report. And I just want to tell you something. If there's aluminum foil in the diapers, I did not give it to them. Because okay. I peel them for the little ones. I, uh, you know, take it out of the wrapper and pick it up. So. It is what it is. Revelation 21, verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, God Himself shall be with them and be their God. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away, and He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And we'll end our text this evening right there. Father, we do thank You that You are a God who is the only one who can take that which is corrupt, that which is defiled, that which is imperfect, and that which is wicked. And Father, you can destroy the wickedness, and then you can make things new. I find great comfort in your character in this simple truth this evening. And I pray more than that, that you would help us to find comfort in the hope of the future. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's been said many times, and it's true, that there is much more written in the Bible about hell than there is about uh, the place where we'll spend eternity. Many times we talk about uh, going to heaven, and I, that isn't inaccurate. I use those terms, especially when I'm encountering lost folks, and I would say something like to the effect of, you know, do you know that you're going to heaven or how that you're going to get to heaven? Is heaven your eternal home? Do you know where heaven is and you know how to get there? Uh, that's, those are good questions. Jesus used that example for Nicodemus, I think, really kind of rang home. Uh, you can't really use GPS for the illustration of it because global positioning sensors are pretty good for this globe but not necessarily for where heaven is. So GPS won't get you to heaven. But the question is, if you had a map of the universe, a map of the galaxies, where is heaven? It's a good question to ask people. Where's God? Where's God? Well, yeah, He's in heaven. Where is heaven? Where is heaven? Well, God is in heaven or in the heavens, but where? Where at? It's, it's a little surprising, isn't it, that people that don't know where heaven is think that they're going to get there. I don't know about you. Sometimes I happen on the right places. How many of y'all use Google? Uh, uh, it's not tracks anymore. It used to be Google Tracks. But you, you you check your timeline on Google to see where you're at. Does it bother you a little bit that Google like knows where you are every minute, every day, and actually has a record of it for as long as you've had a smartphone? It doesn't bother me either. 
I uh, used to think, oh, I don't know about this, but I thought if I ever get accused of anything, and they say, well, where were you at such a time, at such an hour, I just pull out my cell phone and I'll look it up, and I can tell you the precise GPS location where I was. Well, I use it, like if Melissa and I, were out, we like to drive. And if we're out driving somewhere and we happen on a spot, something we like, and I can't remember where it is, I just figure out when it was, go on Google Tracks and track myself, and boom, I can find it. I can get right back there. It's pretty handy to know where something is on the map, and it's pretty handy as well to have GPS. <laughs> I'll tell you something. The chances of my stumbling on the same place twice just driving around, I suppose uh, I suppose I have. Do I have a better than average sense of direction, Melissa? I have a better than average sense of direction. Uh, but I suppose that there are a lot of places that I've been that because of my failing memory, I couldn't get there again because I can't remember having been there. But anyway, Google knows about it. Having said that, it's surprising to me that people expect to make it to heaven. They don't have a clue where it is and they don't have a clue how they're going to get there. And they think it's going to magically happen when they die. So I'll ask people the question, do you know that you're going to heaven? Do you know how you're going to get there? And sometimes people just, they, you know, they've, maybe they've been asked before. Sometimes people answer questions without thinking very much. But that's one that kind of shakes me. I love the way Jesus said it to Nicodemus. He said, no man hath ascended to heaven. He says, nobody's ever been there. You think you're going to get there. No one's ever even been there. How, where is it at? How are you going to get there? That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. And then he said, but the Son of Man, which has come down from heaven, and then he said, hey, if you want to go to heaven, you better find somebody who's been there, and somebody who knows how to get you there, and that's me, Jesus. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, so we know about heaven, we know where heaven is, but the description we find in Revelation chapter 21 uh, uses the terms earth and heaven. And heaven is up, and earth is below. Now I recognize that Kyrie Irving and LeBron James, no, not LeBron, uh, Kyrie Irving and uh, uh, Shaq are confused about the shape of the earth right now. Uh, <laughs> maybe, I like it though. I, I would like to write an article supporting their position just for fun, but you know, sometimes people want to take me seriously, so I better not do that. Uh, but the reality is, you know, you know the sports stars that know everything about everything. As Kyrie Irving says that the earth is flat. And Shaq on uh, NBA Insiders said that um, he believes Kyrie's correct and that the whole thing is like a, the Illuminati and a conspiracy kind of thing to convince people that the earth is round. Anyway, I love that. I love it. If you can get it, buy into a conspiracy, it's a great one. I like it. So, <laughs> but the more ridiculous it is, the better, right? Well, the fact of the matter is the earth is round, the earth is beneath us. And anywhere you go on the earth, it'll be below. So heaven is above, and earth is below or beneath. Okay, let's try it again. Heaven is above, above. above. earth is below. Below. beneath. Okay, so here's something that's going to help us out, and especially for our dear friends like Larry, who are green piecers. And uh, <laughs> I'm not even kidding about this. Larry was a green piece before he was saved. I love hearing him tell stories about before he was saved. I would, I would actually have liked to have known you before you were saved, Larry. But uh, anyway, <laughs> um, they're afraid that people are going to destroy this, the planet by bludgeoning seals and killing whales and, and uh, you know, assaulting sharks and, and so on and so forth. By the way, I, I, I'm really not into gruesome things. I, you know, I'm not like, well, let's go bludgeon seals or kill whales necessarily. You know, if that needs to be done, do it in the right kind of way, whatever. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not pro or con. But they're afraid that man is going to wreck the earth. I mean, they're really afraid man is going to destroy this earth. And can man do damage to the earth? Yes. Yes. Florida's pretty messed up, actually. Uh, a lot of things that have been done in the state of Florida, and by the way, we're all guilty participants in it, so you know, you want to be self-righteous about it. You've got to first move somewhere north of the Mason-Dixon line and then start griping about the people that are wrecking Florida, because if you live here, you're part of wrecking Florida. <laughs> You know, if you're living in a house here, you ruin the swamp, man. I'm sorry, but uh, you're you're guilty. So let's let's not be hypocrites. It's amazing the hypocrites want to live there and make everyone else move away, but they're afraid. You know, we're going to ruin Florida, 
the, we need we need more uh, water uh, on the land in Florida because of you know what gets put into the sky and so forth. But it's okay. It's being made up for by the rising tides, the rising level uh, of the tides and so forth. So you know, good enough. Um, here's the deal. Just like this body needs to make it to the grave in order for it to have lasted long enough to be serviceable to me. This earth needs to make it to the destruction when God destroys the whole thing. God's going to destroy the heaven. He's going to destroy the earth. He's going to make a new heaven. He's going to make a new earth. Now that does not discount in any sense the fact that God told us that we are to have dominion on the earth. That's the job of man. So we're supposed to be stewards of it. We're supposed to take care of it. I'm not for destroying the earth. I'm not for wasting and uh, destruction and so forth. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying about that. But know this. If the earth were in, in our opinions, pristine condition, the day that God destroys it, He's going to destroy it. And it's going to pass away with a great noise. It's going to, the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat. And it will be the reverse of the Big Bang. Except God will have done it. And then God is going to create a new heaven, and He's going to create a new earth. Amen. He's going to make a new one. Okay, that's great, isn't it? Amen. And then something that's going to happen. I just want to cover a, a significant topic this evening. We will finish looking at uh, some of the future things that are going to happen, but I want to kind of get a little sidetracked this evening, or, or if you will, hone in, focus in on one truth, and that is that uh, God is going to wipe away all the tears from our eyes. If you have not to this day experienced great sorrow, your day will come. If you have not gone through very, very difficult, painful times, your difficult, painful times will come. It is only a person who has not really lived who has not experienced pain. Thank God if you have wonderful health and you just feel good. You just wake up in the morning and you just feel good. Someday you will not. Yes. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Uh, my mom used to say, you don't even know what pain is. You don't even know what being sick is. Of course, my mom was one of those, you don't know what pain is, uh, folks. But the reality of it is, is that in our family, I always had exceptionally good health. Just always felt pretty good. Felt pretty well. Never knowingly broke anything on my body until my 20s. So I played basketball, played football, and played hard. Never got hurt. And I don't think, I mean, I could just do things that just didn't hurt back in the day. As I watched people growing old and things functioning not quite as well, parts of the body, digestive system, organs, joints, ligaments, muscles, things tearing, things breaking, things decaying, responding to abuse and so forth, I realized pain's coming. That's physical pain. I do not think, though, that physical pain is anything like sorrow that comes from loss of a loved one, grieving over people who um, make bad choices and have the consequences for them, lost opportunities, lost life, hurt that can happen when people hurt us. The reality of it is that a uh, man that is born of woman is few of days and full of trouble. There's some truth to that. And so when I read Revelation 21, verse 4, and I think of the days, the times when tears have been coming from my eyes, or times when perhaps it's been so much pain that tears can't flow. The Bible says, God is going to wipe away all the tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. That sounds pretty good. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Painful memories. Pain itself. Just the things that are the results of the curse of sin on this world, those things are exceedingly painful. I try not to come across as trivializing anyone's pain, anyone's hardship. I, I never would intentionally do that. 
I recognize that pain is real. Feelings are real. I remember, uh, <laughs> I remember watching. This is this is free. This is for you young people that are here. I remember watching my friends when I was a teenager get into relationships and get dumped. That's what happens if you're a teenager and you get in a relationship. You're going to get dumped or you'll dump. Dumpers and dumpies, I think it hurts less to dump than it does to get dumped, but either way it hurts. I remember somebody saying, you know, yeah, it's puppy love. And they said, you know, uh, maybe puppy love, but a puppy's tail still hurts when you step on it. <laughs> and it's kind of, kind of a truth that rung true with me. And uh, I was always pretty careful when I was a teenager not to get into relationships that could cause pain, that would cause someone else to be caused pain or to cause pain to myself. Because you realize that, you know, you, you, need to be, you need to be committed to marriage before you even play around with something like that. I shouldn't say play around, it's not a game. Uh, being in relationships, because it hurts people. People get hurt. You know, probably some of uh, some of you ladies could say that some of the deepest hurt in your life was when you were a teenager. Relationships, disappointments, things like that. I don't know, uh, but I remember watching my teen friends get broken up with and being despondent and being in tears and crying and hurting. Some people not wanting to go on because of it. It's painful. It's too bad. Unnecessary pain in many instances, but. Painful nonetheless. I've watched I've watched people that are hurt by other people. That hurts, doesn't it? Watch people that have people not care about their feelings or not be concerned about doing right by them and cause them hurt, cause them pain. It's hard to watch, hard to see. I'm very sympathetic toward it. Watch adults go through it. Sometimes because of choices that they've made. Sometimes just because of circumstances that happen in life. Losing a loved one. Losing a loved one is something that is a heaviness and a sorrow on the heart that can't be described. Sometimes it's a pain that you don't even know you're going through. It hurts so bad it just becomes what you're accustomed to feeling. Those pains are hard. And there's some of the things that make even people who know Jesus despondent and sad about life. Life can be painful, my friend. Life can be tough. But rejoice in this truth. There's going to come the day when there will be no future pain and past pain will be wiped away. It's a great precious promise, isn't it? So, what do we do about today, and what do we do about this present life that we live? Because, friend, there isn't a promise in the Scripture that in this life there is no pain. And that's where we get practical, isn't it? It's great to think about the end of a thing, and it's great to focus on the end, recognizing that the end result is good, and therefore the pain is worthwhile or temporary enough that it, in perspective, isn't so bad. When you feel pain, though, it doesn't seem as though temporarily it isn't so bad, does it? Anybody ever push themselves physically? Running, exercising, or doing something extreme like going faster than walking? <laughs> I have on occasion. I know what my body tells me isn't true, but what my body tells me when I'm running is that if I don't stop, I'm going to die. Whatever you're doing right now. My body talks. Does your body talk to you? Mine does. My body has, i got like voices in my hands, my arms, my feet, my legs, my lungs, my heart. They all chatter at me while I'm trying to run. They sound like, you know what those parrots sound like? These indigenous parrots that are around? That's what, that's what my body sounds like when I'm running. It's deafening. It's just sitting there yelling at me, stop, 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 stop. stop. You're going to kill yourself. You know, and killing me, whatever. Um, Sometimes I push through things because, 
you know, hey, body's lying to you. You probably could, you know, run 50 feet and not die. My body doesn't believe it, but I know it's true. Or if you die, then you, you know, that'll be your last pain. It'll be okay. Tell yourself truths. And it helps, doesn't it? To know that there's what we call light at the end of the tunnel. Know it, that there's going to be a breakthrough. There's going to be a time. You ever gotten, because of pushing yourself, have you ever gotten stronger? And you ever gotten more fit? You ever gotten your lungs to where you can breathe and you're running and you actually can run how you want to? I have a running app. Actually, I deleted it. But I had a running app on my phone. It was the Nike one. They messed it up. That's why I deleted it. Not because I've sworn off running forever, necessarily. I had a running app that would say things like, Congratulations, you've reached this place where you get to run a five-mile run today. And it says, Now, what we want you to do is run two miles, nice and easy. And then run hard for two miles. And then run slow for this amount of time. And then sprint out your final mile. You know, thing is, I have two speeds. Stop and go when I'm running. You know, I don't have this... You know, and then they use words like nice and easy. And those aren't accurate words to describe me and running. There's nothing nice, there's nothing easy, there's nothing, you know, run a leisurely, comfortable pace. It's one of the things that said one time, leisurely and comfortable running. Not, not nothing like that. But, I, but you know what, if you, if you continue and you go with the program and you actually work hard to try and do what it says, after a while you realize, hey, I'm running leisurely. This actually isn't that bad. Isn't that hard? And you know, sorrow and pain actually have that effect to where you come to a stage, you come to a place or a point where you realize, yes, this isn't bad. This isn't terrible. And I want to, I want to focus on that truth this evening. How to get to a place in life where sorrow, where pain, where hardship, where the things that cause tears and crying, how to get to the place where they aren't so bad. Where they're not so bad. See, a lot of times I think we think, oh, pastor, why would anyone ever want to do that? Why would you want to, you know, we look at it as though it's like, why would you ever want to trivialize big events or important things? I'll tell you why. So you can live this life out and not be a basket case. So that you can live this life and accomplish God's purpose for your life. It's important for us to know how to live and how to get through hardship. So that really was the message this evening. We know that there's going to be a time, and the first thing that we realize in verse 4 is that there's going to be a time when God wipes away all tears. Now let's go to James, and let's just look at a simple truth. James chapter 1. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So he's, who are the twelve tribes? It's not that cult group in uh, Port St. Lucie. It's, <laughs> it's uh, the twelve tribes of Israel, that are the diaspora, they're scattered around, and he's writing, of course, to believing Jews, believing Israelites. James makes a ridiculous statement or command in verse 2. Actually, it is absolutely ridiculous to any person who's ever gone through hardship. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. That's neither logical nor reasonable. Humanly speaking, is it? It's not logical. It's not reasonable. Divers, many, multitudes, temptations. Temptations would be testings, trials, times, tribulations, hardships, tough times. And James said, when you fall into divers' temptations, count it all joy. Now think about this. What caused the believers whom James is addressing to be scattered abroad. It's in Acts chapter 8. Persecution. persecution. Yeah. How bad was the persecution? Bad. Deadly. I mean, right, you know, James, the brother of John, was killed with a sword. You know, they put Peter in prison. They beat Christians. And uh, Paul had letters, remember? He had letters to go around the world and find people who had left Jerusalem and bind them, bring them back to Jerusalem so that they could persecute them. So that would have been a temptation. Do you think that just the trials, the hardships, difficulties of life might be tough? 
you know, not everybody lost a lot when they were persecuted. In perspective, think of this. What happened in 70 AD? What was the world event, the major world event that happened in 70 AD? Yeah, Jerusalem was ransacked, right? How many Jews either were killed or lost everything in 70 AD? Pretty much all of them. Okay, so in perspective, okay, the Jews in Jerusalem persecuted the believing Jews in Jerusalem who were scattered abroad. A few years later, Jerusalem got destroyed. The people who persecuted the believers, what happened to them? They were killed, destroyed. Okay, if you lost your house in Jerusalem and you had to move to a region away from Jerusalem, in perspective, a few years later, that actually wasn't such a great loss. If you think about it, right? But there was physical loss. I don't mean to trivialize that. I, I want to emphasize that it did happen. I mean, listen, if you had to leave Jerusalem, you left your possessions. You couldn't take everything with you. You lost your possessions. You lost your houses. You lost your business. You lost your connections. You, you, you lost your family. You lost the major, major losses. Not to be trivialized, but ultimately, who was better off? The persecuted before 70 AD or the persecutors? before 70 A.D. It's no-brainer. <laughs> I mean, in the end, certainly the people who were persecuted by the Jews got off far easier. Okay, that's perspective, but do you know that when you're going through it? No. So James said, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And whom is he addressing? Those believers that were persecuted. Okay. From our perspective then, not their perspective, but from our perspective, does it make sense to say, boy, good thing. Good thing they were persecuted. They had never moved otherwise. The Bible says they, they that uh, were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the Word. So the Gospel was preached around the world as a result of the persecution. So the scattering. James mentions to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. Hey guys. From Jerusalem, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. And here's why. He said, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now, patience is valuable, and I think all of us would agree. If we were to choose between patient and impatient people to be associated with, I think we'd agree that we'd take the patient folks. Isn't it so? In other words, patience... Uh, I, I don't tend to see it as such a virtue in me, but I definitely see it as a virtue in you. <laughs> so, we value patience, don't we? When people, you ever had somebody and you realize they're very patient with you? Like, wow, this person's really patient with me. Like, wow. <laughs> you know, they're, they're really, I appreciate it in people, right? So, patience is valued, it's a virtue in others. And James is trying to help believers to understand. That patience, stop that. That patience is a virtue, stop, in us. Charlie messed with the sound. Okay, so now. We ought to know. Silencio. <laughs> we ought to know that patience benefits us. And the reality of it is, is that I know that I'm more efficient patiently or with patience than I am without patience. What does an impatient person accomplish? Nothing well, right? Impatient people give up. They don't get anything done. When I used to work in a mechanic shop, and even now, a lot of times I'll have friends call and say, hey, can you come and help me with this? And they'll say, I just don't have the patience for whatever. And I know I, I know what it's like not to have the patience for something. I don't Because if you don't have patience, you don't finish things. You don't get things done. You don't figure out the real problem. You don't figure out a real solution. So patience has a lot of benefits. And James is simply saying, hey, esteem or value patience... And so when you go through 
persecutions, tribulations, when you go through temptations, understand and know that you ought to count it all joy because it's going to make you better. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I'm better enough. I don't need any more. But God doesn't think that way. Here's how, though. He said, knowing this, that the trying your faith worketh patience, in verse 4, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now, the word perfect means everything it ought to be. Sometimes we think, you know, there are different words for perfection or perfect in, in the Scripture. Katartismos, though, is a word that literally means everything it ought to be. And it's, it's likened to the growing process, actually. Uh, we got a doctor here. You got? Do you have a growth chart for kids? You do the kid thing, growth chart thing. Okay. Now every kid's different, right? Every family's different. But there's like you know ideal for children, and uh, so baby's born. And if a baby is born, say two pounds three ounces, is that perfect? You want the baby to be bigger than that, don't you? Okay. Okay. So. You got to, I don't know what the, the age groups are. You know, I should remember all this child growth and development stuff, but I don't. And, uh, but there is for the time, for the age. Hey, listen, I have greatly improved. I can almost guess children's ages today. When I first started trying to interact with children, <laughs> I couldn't tell the difference between a two-year-old and a ten-year-old. Until they were teens, they weren't, you know, they were subhuman or something, you know. It was like that development process still. So... I've come a long ways, folks. Don't judge me too harshly, right? <laughs> you wonder why I measure the kids on the back of the door there. It's just so I can figure out what age they are and figure out what, what size they're sp <laughs> Okay. Anyway, the reality of it is is that there is a healthy size for an average baby, and they would say it's a perfect Baby, right? I always call everybody's babies perfect because it's not nice to say somebody's baby's imperfect. So I'm like, you know, I'll, I always say this. I bet you think your kid is the cutest kid ever, don't you? You know? And everybody always says yes. That's a, I'll bet that's the cutest baby you've ever seen, isn't it? Yes, it is. Wow, that's nice. A nice baby. Very nice baby. Good baby. So, anyway. <laughs> There are cute babies. I, I have seen them. Uh, but I've also seen not cute babies. And their parents still thought they were cute. So it's a reality. Whatever you, whatever you think, it's your reality. You can have it. <laughs> we're, we're so far away from where we need to be right now. Let's get done. So when you see a toddler, and it's the right size for a toddler, there's like perfect. Uh, when you see a... You know, if I see Caleb at the drinking fountain pressing the button and running water down his shirt, down his pants, and onto the ground, that's normal and natural for Caleb. Not quite right for his dad. Right? In other words, I don't really judge Caleb for taking delight in freezing cold. How can, how can children not feel cold? They don't, though, do they? Kids will go in the water when it's like 60 degrees and all day, and they're shivering, and, and, and they just run right back. They do. I don't. If Lee did that, I would question his sanity. But a child, I would say, normal. That's what they do at that age. Children, that way. Um... And that's perfect. That's the word for perfection. In other words, everything it ought to be. Uh, when, a, when a Christian's newly saved, whatever is in his life, whatever he's dealing with, he's exactly what you'd expect of a, of a baby Christian. Right? That's why Paul uses the analogy. He talks about having to be fed with milk instead of meat. And he said, for the time, you ought to be teachers and you have need that you be taught that others teach you. That's what he said in Hebrews chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he uses a similar analogy as well. The reality of it is that patience makes us, the Bible says, perfect. You ever met somebody and you realized that as they got older, they kind of got better? Or I had a person that 
you used to have a temper and you realized when they got older they didn't. How many parents, how many of your parents became better parents the older they got? They have this saying, adults have this saying of, yeah, you know, I didn't know how smart my dad was until I, you know, until I became an adult. Well, your dad changed when you became an adult, too. It's not, they're not being fair about it. In other words, he grew up. I watched my parents grow my whole life. I've, I've seen growth in my parents my entire life. I think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, it would be too bad, wouldn't it, if my parents, who were saved just a couple years before I was born, were where they were when they got saved a couple years before I was born. Be immature. So the, you understand the word perfect? Perfect means not that you're sinless, not that you never do wrong, but the word perfect means that you're everything you ought to be. And the Bible says that patience has her perfect work. That you can be perfect and entire, wanting that is lacking nothing. We ought to be patient with each other, understanding that truth. We ought to teach each other. We ought to instruct each other. We ought to encourage each other. Hey, yes, you don't think you can control your temper, but the day will come when you know you can. You can have victory in that area. You can have patience. And when you do, you'll be everything you're supposed to be. Perfect. Uh, the question for all of this, though, is how? And that's the final thing I want to look at. Now, as we know the day is going to come, we look forward to it, that God's going to wipe away our tears. And because of that, we recognize that patience is a good thing. We also recognize that patience is a virtue in others as well as ourselves. But the question is how? And I love the simplistic and practical and personally applied explanation that James gives. Look at this. The Bible says in verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom. Now, I have heard first, or James 1, 5 preached by itself a lot of times. How do you get wisdom? Ask of God. My friend, wisdom is, this, in the Hebrew it's the word hakmah, which is a word for skill. In the, in the Greek it's a similar word. It's, it's a word that just means skill. Able to use or apply knowledge. So the Bible says, if any of you lack wisdom, and I've heard people preach, well, you know, if you lack wisdom, this is how you get to be a wise person. Well, you can read Proverbs for that. You learn how, how that if you seek wisdom, if you seek her as, as jewels, or you seek her as gold, or seek her as silver, you'll find her. If you search for her as for silver, you search for her as for hidden treasures, you'll find wisdom. But that's not what James 1.5 is saying with wisdom. The word wisdom is the application of knowledge. And there's been a command to let patience have her perfect work so that you can be perfect and entire. And the question is, how in the world can I do that? And the how in the world that I can do that shows that I lack wisdom to have patience. So wisdom for what? Well, wisdom on how to be patient. If any man of you, or any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. One of the best prayers I ever learned, and this is not vain repetitions, just in case Charlie or Taj are about to judge me wrong. But my best prayer sometimes is, God, I have no idea what to do. And, God, I don't know what you're doing. And, you know, I've had people say, you should never question God. And I found that you should never challenge God. You should never say, God, you're wrong to do this, or God, you ought to do this. But you know, it's a pretty smart thing to say, God, what are you doing? And I'll tell you, it's one of the best things you can ask while you're learning patience. When you're going through a trial, through a time, or a testing. The first reason is because it brings, first of all, an awareness that says, God, I know that you are working in this situation and I believe you and I believe your word and I believe that all things are good for them that love God. And a lot of Christians just immediately tell God, God, this is not good. And they literally rebuke God Himself. I have heard Christians say, and I shudder at the, at the phraseology of it, but they say, you know what, my life is like hell. I've had Christians say that to me. They don't know what hell is. They're using a word, and they're using it almost akin to a swear word, but they really believe their life is so terrible, and they think it's terrible because they think God doesn't know what He's doing. 
And friend, God does know what He's doing. And one of the best things you can ever say is, God, I know you know what you're doing. I do not. And I need wisdom. I need to know what you're doing. It's real help. You know, if I know what something is for, it's a lot better, isn't it? You ever try to help an animal that uh, has a thorn in its foot or some kind of an injury? We were talking about this last week, Stacy, giving cats worm pills. You know, it would be nice if you could just say to a cat, hey, you got worms, take this pill. Do cats ever take it kindly when you try to help them with pills? What do you do? Well, you wrap them in a towel, pry their mouth open, put the pill in their mouth, hold their mouth closed, and then they go, <laughs> and they're good to go after that. Right. Wouldn't it be nice if the cat would say, if you would please kindly tell me why you've strapped me in a towel. <laughs> oh, since you asked, you've got worms, and I'm trying to give you a pill. It's going to hurt, but you'll live. Otherwise, you'll die a miserable, worm-eaten death. And then you give it its... Right? Listen, friends, sometimes the things we're going through in life seem as though God Himself has got His hand in His face against us or turned away from us. And that's the reality of some of the circumstances in life. And I think that the more seasoned believers here could raise their hands and say, I know what you're talking about. And they could say, this has happened in my life and I could not see God's hand, but I know now looking at what God did or I know because I asked God that God showed me what He was doing. And friend, I have had instances in my life where even when a trial was there that I knew what God was doing. I'll tell you something, it sure made it a lot easier to go through the trial. And then there have been instances in my life when I've said, God, I do not know what to do. I don't know what to do. I've learned that's a pretty good thing to say. Pretty intelligent thing to say, both to people and to God. You know, if you don't know, don't pretend to. I don't really help people while pretending you know what's going on when you don't. I, I don't know, but I, I plan on it. I'll let you know when I do. I've had to answer that to people a lot of times. What are you going to do? I have to find out. Don't know. But I know this. I know God. And I know God knows what's going on. I know God knows what to do. And I know that because I know God and He knows what to do, that God's going to give me wisdom so I know what to do. And I can go through anything that way. Before I was married, people used to say, I was an assistant pastor for a while before I was married. I was working on getting married, but I hadn't gotten it completed yet. My wife's a little slow coming around on it. And uh, people would say, well, you know, easy for you to say that, you know. This, you, you've never been married. Everybody had the you've never been married thing. It used to intimidate me just a little bit. People would say, you've never been married. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, what I would tell them oftentimes is what the Bible said. I'd say, well, here's what the Bible says. And they'd be like, well, you know, you've never been married, so you don't know what you're talking about. And uh, I realized from reading the Word of God that a prophet doesn't, that a prophet is a person that says, Thus saith the Lord. And if it's true, because God said so, it's true. And it really doesn't matter. In other words, my experiencing it may validate it for them somewhat, maybe a help to them, but it doesn't make it any more or less true. And it doesn't make me any more or less obligated to give them the truth if, they, if, they, if that's my duty, my responsibility. And um, realize I don't have to go through something in order to know it's right. I'll give you a couple for instances. To illustrate this, I'm almost finished. Sometimes we think that a person has to have fallen or failed in an area in order to be an expert in it. Uh, somebody has a drug addiction and they come and they say, I need help. And we immediately think, do we know of anyone else that had a drug addiction? <laughs> a lot of times we put people that are struggling with the same thing that that person is struggling with together and try to get them to help each other and neither of them know what to do. Or they wouldn't have the problem. Marriages happens all the time, all the time. A couple struggling in their relationship and uh, they, they're having some problems. And we try to find somebody that's in a similar circumstance to them to tell them how to get through it. You know the best thing to do with a couple that's struggling in a relationship? Find someone who's not struggling in their relationship and emulate them. How do you treat your wife? What would you do in this instance? Well, you wouldn't do what I'd do, so how can we relate? No, you wouldn't do it. 
that person would do, and therefore you wouldn't have your problems. It's true a lot of times. My friend Patience works a marvelous work, a perfecting work, and it has great benefits. God's going to someday, He's going to wipe away the tears from our eyes, and there's not going to be death, there's not going to be sorrow, there's not going to be pain, there's not going to be testing, there's not going to be trial, there's not going to be uh, tribulations, and I'm not sure when that's going to be, and so for right now, we're going to be going through some pain. And it's great to look forward to the future and be able to say, okay, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I know ultimately what's going to happen. But how do I get through today? How do we get through tomorrow? What if tragedy strikes this week? What will we do? And I can tell you, not ever having died, that I can die. And I can die with God's grace. Just like before I was married, I could tell you the way a husband ought to be and what a husband ought to do. And I found it's true because I know what God's Word says. I can tell you that you can go through things that you would not imagine possible by asking God for wisdom. And God will give it. God will grant it. The Bible says He giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. In other words, He doesn't say, why are you asking me? Why do you think you deserve to know? No, God is working in your life. He's doing something. And if you ask Him, God, what are you doing? God will say, here's what I'm doing. And here's grace. Here's wisdom to be able to go through this circumstance. Here's how this will help. And friend, you can ask God and God will tell you. He'll give you help. And I just can't think of much more of a practical truth for people that I guarantee will go through temptation. You. You. When's it best to learn a truth like that? After you go through temptation, during temptation, or before temptation? It's best to know before, isn't it? And I hope it's a help to you. Father, thank you for all we've learned this evening. I pray that you would help us to believe it and be ready to live it for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.